coming up this week, you might have thought like I did that the brake pads in electric vehicles aren't something you have to worry about, but you'd be wrong. What I learned from the conversation I'm about to share with you could literally mean the difference between life and death. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 143 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. And this might just be the most important conversation I have ever had. I am not joking. I'm bringing you a recent conversation I had with CEO of Newcap Technologies, Montu Kokar, and record-setting professional race car driver, Blake Fuller, about the weaknesses and failure points of traditional brake pads that are commonly found on electric vehicles. The misconceptions that EV owners have about the way braking systems work on these cars could lead to some very dangerous situations if not properly addressed. I learned so much from the conversation I had with these two gentlemen, and I know that what you're about to hear could save someone's life. So without further ado, let's get right to the conversation. I want to thank you both for taking the time to sit down with me today and talk about a very important topic. But before we get into things, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourselves. Blake, if you would go ahead first and then Montu when he's finished. Yeah, I'm Blake Fuller, and I have the uh, the honor, the thrill and pleasure of both being the team owner for electric performance racing, uh, but also the driver to where I get the opportunity to get behind the the wheel and, and enjoy all the fun things that happen to be involved in racing and motorsports. And, and in the last, I guess now going on 15 years, I have been uh, piloting slash driving uh, vehicles that have had electrified powertrains. Awesome. Thank you for coming on, Blake and Montu. Montu Kokar, CEO of NRS Brake. We make the only galvanized brake pad out in the market. Awesome. And we will definitely get into what that means. Uh, but before we do, I want to really touch on and highlight the problem that you guys are ultimately solving. What is it, Montu, about traditional brake pads or braking systems on OE cars um, or and especially electric vehicles that really is uh, making them something that people need to think about much more than they uh, traditionally would? Well, contrary to what people believe that actually brakes actually wear down, the friction actually wears down, most of the pads are prematurely uh, failed. They fail because of one of no number one uh, cause of failure is corrosion. Uh, what you'll see is we actually are in both the OE and aftermarket for all you know all all brands. Work with Ford, GM, Chrysler, Audi, you name it. And uh, one of the things, the phenomenon that we see is as the vehicle of uh, brake pad come off the vehicle, you will see one common issue. You'll see there's still a lot of friction left on them, uh, whether it's lifted or separated or whatever it may be, uh, but it's uh, breaking apart, jamming, uneven wear, things like that. And that's all caused by corrosion. So this phenomenon is common in uh, the everyday vehicle, uh, the combustion engine vehicles, but in electric vehicles, it takes on a different form. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, when the hybrid vehicle Toyota Prius actually had a recall in their first uh, model year of what, when they uh, released the Prius, because the braking system wasn't coming up to temperature because of all the regen braking. And once it doesn't come to temperature, it doesn't burn off the moisture, you have rust deposits that just accelerate on an electric or hybrid vehicle. And that will actually, you'll see YouTube videos you can look up. People are doing their first brake jobs on Teslas, and you'll see the entire front brake pad or the rear brake pad come complete apart. Uh, and what we've introduced actually is we, everything that we do is mechanically attached. It's not attached by glue, but actually attached by the, those teeth that you see there. And secondly, it's galvanized. It's fully galvanized, meaning the entire plate is coated. It will not rust like your traditional painted brake pad would. Uh, paint will obviously open open wheel with this brake pad. You're going to have debris. You're going to have fall. You're going to have chipping, and paint obviously deteriorates. The glue breaks down. And, you know, as uh, Blake will mention, uh, especially at the speed and the weight of the electric vehicle, you're going to have very high heat. And that will break down the paint and the uh, glue, which will actually cause rust quite a bit. 
So you're highlighting two separate problems there. One, not getting hot enough because they're not being used enough, um, where a lot of people don't realize that with electric vehicles, the regenerative braking, if you're not under a situation where you need to brake hard, you know, and slow down the vehicle very rapidly, you may not actually engage the friction brakes, the pads against the rotors. And by not getting them up to temperature, then the moisture that is going to collect, and there's no avoiding that because cars drive out in, <laughs> out in the environment. They're not in an enclosed space. So the moisture builds up, it causes rust, and that can actually cause the brake pad, the friction material to separate from the backing plate. Yeah, exactly. And then the second problem that you mentioned is with extreme heat, that traditional brake pads, the glues and the other materials and, and that are used to uh, manufacture them, extreme heat can cause damage or uh, failure in that aspect too. So it's kind of like a, a double-edged sword that is the big problem there. Why are we not seeing or maybe not hearing about just widespread failure when it comes to brakes that um, are used on specifically electric vehicles and hybrids that have regenerative braking systems. The market's not, uh, the aftermarket's not big enough yet. Um, you know, you're looking at a very tip of the iceberg now, but you can already start seeing the problems. Now that people are looking at, starting to look at um, their brake systems in the aftermarket, and you're noticing that on the electric vehicle, it's a traditional brake system. It's not a new brake system. It's the hydraulic brake system that we've known for all these years. Uh, that's what we've relied on. Why do we rely on them? Because, you know, the electronics fail. And it's okay if an electronic fails if you lose acceleration. That's that's a different story. Your car doesn't start. But you're not going to want that situation on a braking situation, right? So we've always relied uh, traditionally on the hydraulic brake system where the actual pads have to touch the rotor to create uh, turn energy into um, uh, you know uh, heat, so that's what it has to do. So when that I guess come to Jesus moment happens and you're pressing uh, that brake pad, it needs to start uh, engaging. And what we're finding is, yes, a lot of times we have this rust and corrosion and the separation of friction. But sometimes the friction may not be fully dislodged off; it might be opened up. And our um, um, mechanics and installers are not fully trained right now to visually trained to see that that's a that's a brake failure. Just because the uh, individual was able to come to the garage and get their brakes changed doesn't mean that in a really tough situation, if they had had a panic stop, that would have got the same stopping distance as uh, you would on a fully functional brake pad. So yeah, we may not have a fatal or a really disastrous accident, but that's a problem waiting to happen. Especially for um, when you're getting more and more used to regen braking and auto auto drive, what happens with that is our brain starts getting a little bit more comfortable and used to. And I know I am. I, I drive a Tesla myself, and I'm getting a little bit more and more comfortable with its uh, uh, auto drive features and its, its braking. And however, with all those, there are always situations where we do need to make those panic stops happen. And if the friction is even has a hairline left and it's starting to separate. As it's moving and shaking and rattling in your cage, which I call the caliper, it starts breaking apart. When that moment happens where you really need the brake, you have a gap and a void in the system. And as you know, in a hydraulic system, you cannot have any void, any gap. That's a broken system. You will not be able to brake. And that's what really we are worried about because that's because everything is automated. You get a little bit more relaxed on, you know, even the hydraulic system and. Uh, and get relaxed on the fact that you know your everything should work. Just because everything fires off at the right time electronically, if you mechanically this backing plate is not holding the friction to it, you're going to have a problem. And that's really what we're going to start seeing as a large, uh, big phenomenon going forward for the last two plates. Sure. So really, what what I hear you saying is that ultimately, if the friction material is separated from the brake. Uh, pad backing that it doesn't matter how great the rest of the system is you're having a brake failure especially under a panic stop and instead of the brake system stopping your vehicle you're going to be stopped by whatever you end up hitting that's right that's right but by definition you're missing one piece of the system it's not a system anymore right so it's only as strong as its weakest link 
Do you find that brake pads, especially with modern vehicles and EVs, is that the weakest link in the braking system at this point? I would say so. It's the only thing that we haven't um, changed. It's, it's traditional. It's the way we've always relied up, upon it. Uh, and again, I think this thing with the first problem I mentioned, which is the uh, not getting brakes up to temperature, that's the key point I want to uh, nail down here with the regen braking. It's, it's something that hasn't widespread yet. You can start seeing it pop up, and the best best uh, uh, temperature check always uh, with this kind of stuff is always be online. And I guess obviously you're very strict on with that with that community. And if you start looking at some of these videos of people popping up, and you start seeing the friction coming clean off, that's really what we're starting to notice. But we've addressed these issues. So like um, you had mentioned about OE versus aftermarket, we're involved with both. Sometimes the aftermarket, actually a lot of times the aftermarket has to help drive the OE because you don't necessarily see the issue until it's widespread and everybody's using it and you see the brakes coming off the vehicle as opposed to putting a brand new brake pads on. There's only so much you can test in a test environment and all the different uh, vehicle testing you do. It's through years of uh, uh, driving on it with different driving styles and you start seeing the issues pop up. And we're starting to see that now. Sure. And it's better to do all of the research and development um, and we'll talk to Blake about this on the racetrack in a performance environment where overall it's much, much more safe than driving on the road with your regular passenger car. Uh, we don't want to let the population essentially be testing and returning the results from their real world issues. We want to prove it out on the racetrack first. And then, you know, bring that into your passenger vehicle, whatnot, because it's so much safer. Somebody has brake failure on track and they run into a wall of tires at 150 miles an hour. The chance of them surviving that is much, much more likely than if somebody is on the street and they're going 60 miles an hour and their brakes fail and they rear end somebody. They're going to get hurt. So obviously we want to focus on what can be done to really uh, reduce and ultimately eliminate brake failure when it comes to people driving around their passenger vehicles. Yeah, and we begin this conversation with exactly that, the two extremes, and we have to tackle all. And uh, of course, it's, it's uh, fun to talk about the race stuff, but it really is very important. And Blake was a no-brainer for us as, as he's the uh, premier EV uh, vehicle uh, race car driver out there. And we say, let's take our had to the limit to see what we can do. Because remember, when you hand people these vehicles, there's no warning signal on there telling me, hey, don't take it this speed, don't do this, don't try to go downhill and you know, it weighs this much. And you know, you put a young person, an inexperienced, inexperienced driver behind it, that's any vehicle, by the way, not just electric vehicle. And this method doesn't come with a warning label. So really, it needs to be able to do everything a um, that you were able to do in a race car. So what we wanted to do was make sure that it can perform at the extreme, which is what Blake has been doing, which is great. That's why we wanted to put that stamp of approval and peace of mind in our head that okay, we can achieve what this these electric vehicles are capable of and the momentum that they carry and give it the big braking power it needs. However, the everyday issue, which is the longer term issue of corrosion and breakdown, we also solve that. And that I always say, and I know if people that are not in the braking industry don't quite get it, but I say this is the harshest environment. Any composite material, and a composite, of course, two different materials coming together, can operate in on planet Earth. And I do, I do say that because if you think about the friction material itself, it's very similar to the same material that you're using to, to uh, get a space shuttle back into uh, onto orbit. And what we're talking about here is we are talking about a very uh, sophisticated material joined to a steel backing plate, which needs to go through all those extreme temperatures that uh, a vehicle can go through, open to the entire environment, whether it be salt, so winter, uh, and imagine going to speeds and, uh, and, 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 and heating up uh, that uh, rotor up to, you know, a thousand C and then quenching it, hitting a puddle, and then it, it going through that uh, cooling process and still being able to work repeatedly and not break down. That's what we're dealing with here. That's why we're tackling all everything at that spectrum to make sure you give it the longevity. It doesn't break down over time due to corrosion, but also it can perform at that extreme temperature. What are the things with 
most people, and they're like you said, they're not going to be putting their braking system to the extreme, hardly ever, if at all. You know, most people, they are going to just use their vehicles to drive to and from work, run errands, maybe go on a road trip a couple times a year. The fastest that they'll likely be going is maybe 80, 85 miles an hour, depending on where they are in the country. If they have a situation where they need to to stop very quickly, yes, that's going to put some heat in there. But most people, if they're driving responsibly, they're not going to run into a situation where they have a need for stopping very quickly. So then what is it that people should be doing to maintain their brake system in terms of having it checked out by somebody else? Or is there something that they can do? Or even while they're driving, different habits or things that they can do to improve the chance of their brake pads not failing or not wearing out? Yeah, well, number one, um, I would recommend, and I would recommend that changing all front and rear brake pads at the same time. I know we've gotten into a situation where you'll know typically people will change just their front or just their rear, depending on what the levels are, or the installer will tell them. But I would say, first of all, always buy a very high quality brake pad, right? Obviously, we would be recommending our NRS galvanized brake pad, uh, but, and it is a high end brake pad, uh, you know, but you're not paying for the brake pad itself. You're always paying for the brake job. So if you have your car lifted up and you're, you've got, you're paying for the brake job. First of all, I recommend changing both front and rear. Of course, if it's available from that same um, brand like ours, you want to get that same consistent feel. That's number one. The reason why we got into only changing, let's say, fronts more than rear, and that's what you'll see. You, you almost change fronts almost twice or three times more than you change the rear is because well, we originally, when they uh, started introducing this brake pad, the dr- uh, rear was still a drum brake and the uh, front rear became this. And it's just something that we got all, all got used to. Number two, of course, I want to say you want to go with something that has a coating on it, like a zinc, zinc nickel. Because remember, all OEs will usually apply, even before they apply paint, they will apply some sort of a coating on it, some sort of a, a zinc or a nickel zinc, things like that, some sort of a galvanization process. Aftermarket, that is not done. So that's why when I mentioned that we are the ones that do galvanization, you can tell it. If you can see it, it looks different than every other brake pad out there. So I would say try to go for something like that because um, one of the things that you know, you're not going to realize um, is that corrosion is the number one killer of your brake pad, not necessarily the wear. Um, the uh, last thing is if you have start seeing those, uh, hearing those noises, vibrations, whatever, right away, I would say it's time to go go to the garage, go to the installer that you trust and get that checked up because that is a telltale sign. Something doesn't like something else. That's the, my, my definition of you hear a noise, uh, two things don't like each other and uh, you need to go fix one of them. Yeah. So you had mentioned changing both front and rear at the same time. Why? Well, you want that consistent feel. Well, first of all, number one, I'm just going to go right to the uh, pocket and you, you're going to change the front. You're going to go back out, and I've seen this a lot, and a lot of installers have told me, you know, a week later, two weeks later, now the rear starts acting up. What you what you were able to sell them on a front uh, brake pad and do their proper brake job, they may not have, that installer may not have done their rear brake job. That may, installer may uh, not know what pads are on there. That installer may not know what other cancers are in that, in that, in that brake pad. Even though it may have a lot of friction left on it, there may be other issues because once you do, once you get a, uh, a a reputable brand product, I would say you do that once you do the front and rear at the same time. And then, sure, if down after that, the front starts wearing a lot sooner than the rear, that's fine. Then you keep it consistently moving. But that initial, what I would recommend uh, right now would be take your car in and get full of both front and rear of a reputable brand that you either trust or, of course, uh, is a premium product. Sure. And I know we're not doing this as an infomercial for NRS breaks, but I do want to take a minute and really dive into uh, what makes your pads so significantly better than almost any other option out there. At, at the very least, the value of it, what you're getting for the price 
Um, but the technology uh, and really how it works and, um, you know, give you an opportunity to kind of brag a little bit here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, well, number one, they are mechanically attached, right? So what that means, every other brake pad out there is going to be attached with a glue. This is mechanically attached. Once you mechanically attach a friction to this, you're able to coat this product in a zinc coating. And zinc coating we find to be the uh, best as in uh, for environmental impact. Zinc is an abundant and it's an electroplating, so obviously it takes a negative charge and a positive charge on zinc and only uses the amount of zinc that's needed to apply to that vacuum plate. And then we're able to apply uh, friction in segments. And that's another thing that is important about this. We don't have to wait for glues and paint to cure or get into the environment in the river. So I would say um, environmentally, it's the, it's the best brake pad out there. Um, and then um, lastly, what I would say is once you have a vacuum plate that can last you uh, for the life of the friction, you have eventually have the longest lasting brake pad out there. So the combination of all of those things uh, really would, I would say, make it the ultra premium brake pad out there and the future for not just EV braking, but for any, any vehicle that you want. So especially for electric vehicles that don't use the friction brakes as often as a, a vehicle with a gas or diesel engine. What are the chances that if somebody put on a set front and rear of NRS brakes, like right when they first got the car, um, what are the chances that they'd ever have to replace their brake pads again under normal usage? Probably not. You wouldn't have to change them. I would think so. Under normal usage, Let's say if you keep your vehicle for five to seven years, I'm just making that up, but let's say you even sure. keep it for 10. Yeah, let's call it five to seven. You would not be changing those brake pads. Uh, they, but I'd rather have that security of knowing that I've changed them once and I have them there and they're going to work every time, um, even especially because of knowing all the issues that if you have your brake pads on your car, especially for EV uh, vehicles, for longer than you traditionally had on uh, uh, traditional vehicles, they are going to rust and fall apart. That's going to happen. It may feel like they're not, but then when you need them most, they might uh, that might happen. So the idea is to always have these, so you can just forget about it at the end of the day. So now that one last, now you one last thing. I think you only want to be responsible for filling in your windshield uh, fluid. That's about it. On a EV right. Vehicle. Nothing else. Yeah. Well, and, and that is one of the reasons why people buy EVs is because of the reduced maintenance and i won't say eliminated because nothing is maintenance free you know over time everything is eventually going to uh need to be addressed or replaced um you know things wear out but if you will use what you said you know five to seven year window of when people are going to keep their car before replacing it to not have to think or worry about the brakes not working, first of all, you know, to have something that's reliable, but then also basically maintenance free. And of course, we can't just, you know, say there has to be an asterisk with with a statement like that. You know, we can't just say uh, you never have to worry about it ever, 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 because uh, you never know what might pop up. Uh, but to significantly reduce the mental anxiety that somebody might have there's a lot of value to that that goes even beyond the the product itself that's exactly right yeah absolutely and that's really what it is at the end of the day i think we had brought it down to just the brakes that you pretty much have to go in for maintenance for ev vehicle and right now if you've noticed a lot of the garages do not accept you uh if you bring an ev vehicle in so this way if you can just kind of go and replace this one set with the NRS brakes. And what you can do is just kind of really stay out of the garages and kind of drive with a peace of mind. That could be really good for you. Yeah, the last thing I want to do is have my car in the shop for anything. <laughs> I don't care what it is. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I want to drive my car and I want to park my car. I don't want to leave it with somebody else and trust that. I mean, granted, there are absolutely very reputable, trustworthy shops out there. But they're not all the same. And especially, like you said, a lot of them aren't familiar with electric vehicles. You know, if you have an EV that you don't use the brakes all that much and you're taking it to a shop that doesn't have a whole lot of experience with EVs, they're going to most likely just check the wear of the friction material. 
they're not necessarily going to be checking for corrosion because it's not used. So then ultimately what we end up with is a car, even if the owner is doing everything right by taking it in and having things looked over, we can still run into a situation where the brake pads are deteriorating without anybody being aware of it. Well, that's, that's the issue right there, right? It, it Almost everything corrodes underneath the car. So we've gotten almost visually okay. I'm talking about uh, well-seasoned mecha- uh, mechanics that have gotten visually okay to say, oh, yeah, that's corrosion, yes. But, I mean, you're going to see that once you start taking it apart and you start seeing what's happening, you start seeing the lift and the deterioration on the on the on the friction on the uh on the vacuum plate you're gonna start seeing these issues but just from a visual check you take off the wheel you start looking at everything is corroded you think yeah that's normal but it's yeah but it shouldn't be normal especially not on the brake pad itself right because you know you could have a little bit of let's say uh lot rod and surface rust on the rotor that's fine that swipes away uh but on a brake pad you're getting into a friction field that's porous you're getting into the uh, interface layer of the fr- uh, friction and the vacuum plate, and that's going to pop that right off. And it might do it right away, or it might do it in a few months' time, or it might do it in a year's time. But you don't know when that bomb is going to go off. Yeah, and that is something that I don't think people realize. And that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to put together this podcast to begin with, is because it can be something that is going on without anybody being aware of it. And then the moment that you find out is when you needed the brakes to work and they didn't. So I'll say it again, literally could be life or death and best case scenario if brakes fail, you're talking about maybe minor injuries. What we want to avoid is ultimately even an accident. You know, if you, if you don't cause damage to your car, the idea pops into my head that, okay, you've got your your traditional brake pads they are deteriorating nobody has known that that's happening because the shop that you've been using for the last 30 years isn't familiar with the fact that ev brakes aren't necessarily getting up to operation temperature so then you now have a situation where you maybe you're low speed and you rear end somebody well that's still potentially a, a traffic ticket it affects not only your vehicle and the, that it now has an accident on its report. So it's not worth as much when you go to resell it. And maybe you uh, cause injury to somebody else and your insurance premiums are going to go up because now you have an accident. I mean, all of these things could be prevented simply by making sure that the brake pads are good and proper and, and, and going to be there. So it's not just... I mean, when it when you take into account all of those things, it's really, really difficult to, to uh, have price be an objection. And you had said they're premium and obviously based on vehicle and application, the price is going to be different. But at what point is it really worth not anything, but worth the extra amount, maybe when it comes to price to have that peace of mind, to have that. Uh, practical guarantee that you're going to avoid all of these problems. Yeah, I mean, exactly. But again, I always come back to saying you're paying for a brake job, not the brake pads. So even if the brake pads are a little bit more than your traditional off-the-shelf brake pad, uh, these are the more than that. But the brake job, the guy, uh, the installer has your car lifted up. They're charging you for the brake job. So you might as well go for the extra, the better brake pad that's going to last you so you're not back in that shop again paying for another brake job, right? And I'm sure you're probably going to get into it with Blake, but, uh, you know, Tesla's uh, the Plaid is offering the 20,000 upgrade kit. Now, I know he uh, he will probably get into talking about, um, you know, that you, you you know, whether it's here or not, or it should be uh, it should be standard on all the, all the, all the Plaid's. We say, and I'm a strong believer in this, that just with our brake pad, you can actually enhance your system. You don't necessarily need to go to the old uh, full um, rotor, uh, carbon driver rotor, because our brake pads have been tested at extreme and the everyday driver. So what you can do is you can get a better feel of, uh, without spending that $20,000 extra uh, for the uh, brake job there. Now, yeah, there could be some cases made for fluid and things like that for a really high, high temperature, but really for the everyday driver, 
you're getting a whole new uh, feel on your car, whole new confidence on your on your vehicle, especially with our race car. And you don't need to go spend thousands of dollars on it. Well, that's really great. So now, Blake, I want to transition to you and kind of talk about the extreme use of brake pads and and get into that a little bit as well. You've had experience with the Model S Plaid, and mm-hmm. one of the biggest, I guess, complaints that a lot of people have is with the stock braking system, not the twenty thousand dollar upgrade. What is it Which about? Is still not there yet. <laughs> it's still right, not available right. Yet. <laughs> uh, you know the the pending upgrade, if you will, um, which yeah. I think they should have just done on all of the cars to begin with. What is it that makes the Plaid uh, stock braking system so inadequate? Yeah, so it, it's interesting because um, not just the Plaid, but all electric vehicles are intended to be extremely slippery in the air and very aerodynamic. So that means that when you would be at speed, you have less less wind drag slowing the vehicle down. Next, your electric vehicles are typically between 500 to 1,000 pounds heavier than your standard internal combustion vehicle. And when we start talking about the Plaid specifically or a Porsche Taycan or others, you have vehicles that now that time between when you're braking and you're back up at speed to brake again, that that cycle slash wavelength of acceleration to braking is a much shorter period than almost any streetcar ever before. So you have a vehicle that has the accelerative capability that meets or exceeds a Formula One car or an Indy car. And I can speak to that because we do a lot of testing at Sebring and at Daytona and other cars will be testing. And, you know, if I line it up right next to an LMPH car, I can sit there and pull even with them down the straightaways. Guess who's, that's kind of, I have to get on the brakes a little sooner because my car weighs twice the amount and has z- almost zero downforce um, and, and is a lot slipperier through the air. So really, um, when we talk about the, the issue with it, it's they have a car that weighs a lot that doesn't have much drag and is able to repeatedly accelerate to insane speeds in, and, and, and just, you know, people hear of quarter miles, but really, you know, 160 miles an hour from a standing still in nine ish seconds. And if you're on a racetrack and you're exiting an average corner of between 30 to 70 miles an hour, your speed, you know, I was at Coda and we just recently um, set a record for the highest EV speed ever attained. We, we hit other records we'll talk about, but you know it's sitting there on the on the speed limiter at 174 175 miles an hour two thirds down the back straight and that exceeds speeds that you know a GT3 RS would be hitting at its very final braking point so um yeah it's accelerative capabilities is just insane and because it's such a heavy vehicle while it can get through the corners quickly the cornering speed is not necessarily higher than other cars so you still have to bring it back down to a pace of an average production car. So it's it's an insane ask of a of a braking system, and then it's even more insane when you start taking a step further into what the pads have to endure and what the vehicle system has to endure. So you, your standard car that you drive on the road, you're using your brake pads pretty much every stop, and they're not only having surface interface but they're also you know when you're going out to a track they're being brought up to some temperature that can be you know kind of equalized whereas with uh, regenerative braking there's a possibility that that vehicle that if it was driven to the track you may have never utilized the friction brakes until the first time you either ideally are <laughs> setting them in for the track but you know you could theoretically the first time you use your brakes in weeks could be turn one and that is something that is a huge thermal demand and just it, it's a lot to ask of the pad material, but it's even more to ask of a backing plate and how the material is is held by that backing plate that ultimately is your last line of defense for being held within the vehicle mechanical system. Because if that shears off, you you are literally just going sailing, <laughs> yep. as we've seen happen for people. Yeah, your brakes so, are yeah. no longer the pad. It's whatever you end up hitting. Yes. Yeah. And because of the and because of the Formula One type acceleration, you know, brake temperatures and the capability to build temperatures is into the thousands of degrees Celsius if if given the opportunity of with the plaid. So it, it's um it's it's an incredible ask of any type of material to be able to endure that. 
Sure. And of course, braking systems are just there to turn that uh, kinetic energy, the movement into heat. So being able to not only withstand those high temperatures, but also be able to eliminate the heat from the braking system when it's not being used, stock brake systems are not designed for that. And especially when you have cars with this level of acceleration performance, people are naturally going to be pushing the car a little bit harder than you might mm-hmm. with, you know, a Toyota Camry, for example. Uh, you know, if you can do zero to 150 in, you know, less than nine seconds, um, yeah. <laughs> that's that's getting to a point that's really scary when you have people that are not experienced with any kind of racing, but then also the stock brakes. And I know we've talked before, but after just a couple of corners on a track, your brakes are not going to be there. You're going to have significant brake fade. Well, on the street, if you are showing your friends the zero to 60 or, you know, zero to a hundred or whatever, and then hitting the brakes hard. Well, after a couple of pulls like that, what are people likely going to have an issue with? Yeah. So if they've never been bedded in on the standard brakes, you're going to have them somewhat, you know, for lack of a better term, glaze over and start to quickly off gas. And it's going to possibly catch on fire, um, which will damage the actual pistons on the, on the calipers. And, and uh, you're going you're gonna to have a little bit of an open flame, but even if somebody's properly bed in their stock, pads on a plaid within your second stop from 150 miles an hour just the second stop will have greatly increased stopping distances and here's the thing is that you know a lot of this conversation can be split into two ways one is having fun reliably and safe at the track and the other is how little distances can be huge life-changing results in safety for a vehicle meaning that on the road sometimes inches or feet count And when you're able to have a car that can accelerate to 100 miles an hour plus so quickly, those, not legally, but those distances close. And just because it happened to have worked the first time in a stop, absolutely does not mean it's going to work that second time in a stop. And that's that's something that is a psychological challenge for people to comprehend that there would even be a car like that. Um, But when you're not shifting gears, you're not hearing sound and a car is whisper quiet and can do things effortlessly. You just really don't even have the time to acknowledge the speed that you're traveling. And, and I think that that's why there's been, unfortunately, fatalities and there's been huge issues in the in the world of the the plaid and or other teslas and even other evs is because we are giving somebody an accelerative tool without giving them the ability to restrain that it's kind of a minimal compliance at this point with some of the the braking systems and reliability they're looking 10 years out they're looking at you know how do they have brake fluid brake lines and brake pads that ultimately people just kind of put on and forget about which is something we talked about some of the concerns that happen with EVs as to, should I say, non-intentional negligence (laughs) of maintenance (laughs) because the cars are so easy to maintain that it doesn't mean your other vehicle systems don't need to be maintained like a regular car. Uh, But when we're talking about, you know, somebody on the street and and kind of NRS specifically, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that we we do have uh, another partner to our program, which is Unplugged Performance, and they do provide a carbon ceramic system and that system has less weight and less um it has a lot more ventilation space and it has the capability to be able to recover from a high thermal load quickly and it's a lot lighter from an acceleration standpoint um, but the the peak stopping power of that type of upgraded system which can do it repeatedly um, we've worked with nrs to be able to provide a a, a pad that can go into the stock braking system with the stock rotors and is able to equal the same mu factor, the same grip level factor for multiple repeatable stops at that same level. Now, if we were to say, let's go do five laps or 10 laps, that's a different ask of the braking system. But from a from a, a, a true street performance or an ability to have something you feel comfortable carving up the canyons at legal speeds, or at least at the point of what most people feel comfortable or to go autocrossing, 
um, or to do an HPD event that um, the person's not looking to set a lap record, the, the, the replacement pads that we've worked with NRS to develop are just phenomenal. And they're very um, re reliable and, should I say, repeatable and that's confidence is like the biggest thing with breaking you know i i would rather which is not the case here but i've told people i'd, I'd rather have 80 percent capability all the time than 100 percent than 20 percent than 100 percent than 20 percent because as a driver you, you you cannot rely on something that isn't consistent and so what we've worked with nrs to do is to develop pads that um, work both at very low temp like what would be from a car that's regen that you almost barely touch the brakes ever um, to where on a panic stop they work well but also something that comes up to its temperature profile and then when it does reach its thermal limit which is is quite high you know you're looking at about a thousand to 1200 degrees fahrenheit um that the way that the the mu or the grip level drops off is is understandable and, and and allows for feedback as a driver so um really really stoked about that to have something that doesn't necessarily require the twenty thousand dollars spend for your enthusiast that that wants something safer um and, and again you know with braking it's it's just like tires you know you can you can you can spend and spend and spend and there is a certain point where the cost just keeps going up and you get small incremental gains sure sure and i think we see that with a lot of different things um, in your experience, if somebody is wanting to have their daily driver and take it to the track every now and then, maybe once a month, a couple times a year, you know, not where they're regularly tracking the car, braking obviously is going to be something that needs to be addressed. In addition to pads, or, or really, I guess I should say, can somebody get away with just replacing the pads? and keeping the stock rotors and brake lines and stock brake fluid and everything else and still have what you would describe as being that predictable feel to it where it's going to perform the same way every time that they're entering into a corner or during a panic stop on the street okay so the quick answer and there's a few different ones in there quick answer is no um it it's uh the, the the pads are ultimately the first line of offense slash defense of being able to to do the job from a repeatable friction level. But what applies that pressure is going to be the rest of the items mentioned. So your your next weakest link, which is absolutely immediately addressable and needs to be done, is the fluids for a higher temperature fluid. And it shouldn't just be a single like oh we've done it once, forget about it for five years. Um, because of moisture content in different atmospheres and braking systems that that should be serviced regularly. And then from there, depending on the vehicle you're talking about would depend on the type of pedal feel and improvement that the driver is going to have as to the benefits of replacing the lines or other things. But yeah, ultimately, pads and fluid, those should be decisions made together and done at the same time. It just makes sense. Um, and then from a cost savings, most uh, stainless lines or braided lines, it's worth a couple hundred dollars just to get it done at that time. Just do everything right the first time. And then you're looking at a package that's going to probably be about a thousand dollars for somebody to have a system that goes from being questionable, i.e. deadly in the plaid standpoint, to something that is uh, a repeatable, much higher threshold of performance and reliability that also allows for them to enjoy the the rest of the capability of the car. I mean, what, what's the fun of having a car that accelerates that fast if you can only safely do that a couple of times, right? Something that I've said a lot and not just when you and I are talking, but just in general that the racing world, the research and development that goes into the vehicles that are used for racing, it makes its way down into the performance and, and even the vehicles that we use just for running around getting groceries. I mean, a lot of that technology has originated in the racing world. When it comes to brakes and braking systems, like you've identified, EVs need very specialized braking systems because of the excess weight and the extreme acceleration performance that they provide. Should we expect to see um, some of the stuff that you are really pioneering? Should we expect to see that make its way into the OEM? aspect or is that something that will probably be only in maybe aftermarket options it's going to come into two answers on this the first of which is that you're going to you're going to see 
um, as the market matures such that uh, I like to take people on a, a mental journey back to the 1960s in the United States, where there was the horsepower wars of the Mustangs, the Camaros, the Mopar vehicles, and it was who could go down the quarter mile the quickest. And then, you know, along came individuals that said, wait a second, um, you know, Penske's well known for that, um, where they in Shelby, where they said, wait a second, we actually want these cars to corner and to stop and to thermally cool so that we can use them on a racetrack in all aspects, not just acceleration. And so where we're at right now is that we've had this kind of acceleration horsepower war that has occurred with Tesla kind of leading the, this is how we get people to adopt these cars is to show them how quickly and stupidly fast they can be in acceleration and they handled decently and but haven't stopped so well you're going to start seeing that the competition with all of the different manufacturers are going to continue to up the game to the level of what we have commonly accepted with say an m car or an amg or others which means that they won't be braking systems that will be as poorly should i say brake pad placed as what the plaid was originally uh, or fluid wise you're going to see vehicles that have a bit more capable base system but the, but you're still going to look at there's going to be a need for the aftermarket to be able to take that that platform and, and go further but there isn't just going to be kind of such a, a, a failure of, of the braking system because it won't be acceptable as the market matures you're also going to see more and more unique approaches to how vehicles are uh managed with their braking system. So we haven't even talked about vehicle stability or traction control yet. And with a traditional vehicle, it's kind of progressed to where about 10 years ago, you saw that mechanical limited slips and other types of systems that would be non-braking reliant to be able to provide traction control or be able to provide stability management, um, the braking system pretty much was only being utilized when braking. Whereas about 10 years ago, you started to see it quickly progress through the market where the braking system is beyond just decelerating the car. It's actually somewhat helping it accelerate by keeping the, the tires right at their optimal grip slash slip angle um, and then also keeping the car stable so that when somebody thinks that they can drive a supercar like a super driver <laughs> that that the that the car helps it kind of enable that fantasy um, and and that puts a lot on the braking system so that's another issue with the plaid that we haven't adjust, addressed but you know it has 400 horsepower capable in the front with an open differential with a vehicle that when exiting a turn is such that that inside wheel is now relying on that front braking system to arrest the motion. What's interesting, though, is that in the rear with torque vectoring, it's not relying on the brakes as much for that. So that now you're going to see kind of as things go along, you're going to see vehicles with torque vectoring kind of almost bringing hopefully the braking system into its normal kind of usage but then you're going to see other vehicles that are electric vehicles that are still heavy with open differentials that may have dual motors just a single front single rear with open diffs that are still going to be relying heavily on the brake system but they're going to have so much more torque to deal with that's the other side is that 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 torque capability of the electric motors um is something that has to be arrested when you're when you're going through the the corner so it's uh there's going to be a, a a whole lot of vehicle systems and dynamics and tuning that's we're gonna we're gonna see and we're gonna see some new braking systems come to market soon that will be um, without hydraulic fluid that will be coming to the market soon um, and those type of electronic braking systems we already see in the parking brake of a lot of vehicles now but as the response of those type of systems occur and their capability there's um, it all comes back down to in the end of the day though we're still gonna be relying on pads material and backing plates, which is why NRS is like so perfectly positioned as having that platform that others can build from. And as Monty has talked about is that it's ultimately, um, it all comes down to the, the the platform you build on, which is the backing plate. And then from there you progress outward. So um, yeah, it's to answer your question, we're gonna see some of the innovations that happen in racing like what we're doing i think for from our standpoint it's less the us changing the oem per se and it's more of our role is to educate and change the perception of 
the average consumer, but also to educate them on the need for quality components when they might assume that just because they're spending $100,000 on a vehicle that has all this great new technology and can be software updatable tomorrow, it doesn't automatically update its hardware. And that's still to them, they still have to do that job. And it's it's more critical than ever for them to really enjoy their car. So I think that that's kind of where it'd be great to allow Monty to elaborate on that some. Yeah, well, and something that I'm going to be saying a lot during this podcast is that this is in many ways, literally between life and death, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's not an exaggeration where when it comes to brakes, you want them to work, you want them to work all the time, and you want to almost intuitively know exactly what to expect when you're stepping on the brake pedal, how the vehicle is going to respond. And to the technologies as they're evolving, you see that now manufacturers, including Tesla, are starting to do more and more friction brake blending with region brake blending to offer um, that repeatable pedal feel for consumers. It's going to take a few years for that to propagate through all the different vehicles and to be done so that it's somewhat transparent. We saw that happening with hybrids, you know, the initial hybrids, like the one I was racing, that transition between friction brakes and regen was not always consistent, but as we look at the most recent hybrids, it's transparent and somebody, you know, somebody would have to be a true enthusiast or engineer to say, this is when the electricity deceleration has stopped and the friction brakes are actually doing their job. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to be at a time when, when you get to see all this occurring (laughs) and actually to to be out there kind of testing those limits. And uh, yeah, it it could not be possible for us without NRS's help because they were like how I pioneered lithium ion batteries for for race cars. Um, Montu and his team uh, being enthusiasts in the electric vehicle space said, wait a second, why is nobody else out there paying attention to the needs of this market and addressing it soon? And and I think that's a, a, I mean, 2016, seven years ago now. So it's uh, <laughs> it's the first mover advantage. It's a great point. Just just to put something in there uh, for the OE versus aftermarket, uh, we work. We love working with people like uh, Blake, and of course, Blake's been a big uh, proponent of launching this electric vehicle brake pad for uh, for the aftermarket. But that's really how you drive the OE change at times. We're in both OE and aftermarket. A lot of times, you can pitch to OE. But really, the people taking the vehicle to the limit, like Blake, will actually do the testing. We'll actually say, okay, you know what? This vehicle is capable of this. Do the components work? And do they perform to what the vehicle allows you to do, allows the daily driver to do? And that kind of drives the change in OE. So we approach both markets, OE and aftermarket, at the same time. But you will see a lot of times the aftermarket drives the change in OE. Absolutely. And that's a great, great point to make. Blake, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I know yes, you got to run, you. but uh, yep. thank you so much for coming back on and sharing your expertise. Certainly you are pioneering in many ways with the performance activities, we'll call it, uh, that you're working with. And certainly I think that's something that the value of that cannot be understated. So I want to thank you not only for the work that you're doing, uh, as much fun as I'm sure it is, <laughs> but yeah. but also for your, for your time and, and taking some time to come on and talk about that. No, I appreciate it. And it's it's great with what you're doing to be able to help communicate that outward. Because again, it, it um, what we learn, if it's not shared, it, it only benefits us. And that's not why we do this. It's it's ultimately to to educate others so that they can make better choices. And you know, they may not be racing their vehicles, but ideally we want them to have the best experience with something they work hard for and something that will be safe. So yeah, it's great. So thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump. Awesome. So Thanks so much, it. Blake. I thank you. So Montu, I want to give you the chance to kind of respond to anything Blake might have said before he had to run off. You know, is there anything that we want to cover uh, that that can kind of tie it all in? Yeah, I mean, he did talk a lot about the performance and the high performance of it. I just want to say that 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 we do take all of our uh, brake pads to the extreme, and Blake obviously is the perfect person to test that. Um, but one of the things that I want to say is that on the everyday driver, which is, I am the test for, on my Tesla, I've had my brake pads on for a few years now, and that's where we we test them, we monitor them every six months just to show uh, what the progress is, 
and we can see it's a night and day compared to your traditional painted pads. And I'm going to show you something. It's a good finish probably, right? But you'll see a rust, rusted uh, brake pad, and I don't know if the light's catching it, but there's a lot of friction left on it. But obviously there was issues with this product. And you can already see that not just is, is rust a problem for the friction side of it, but here the shim came up. So the noise insulator, and again, I'm only showing this to you briefly because I don't want to talk about their, their brand, but that's off my vehicle where the uh, rust caused the shim to start lifting. Obviously, there's a noise issue. Obviously, I can hear that, feel it, feel the vibration. And so not only is it a issue for safety, but the day-to-day -day convenience. And remember, electric vehicles are very quiet, and especially if you don't have any uh, music on or anything else going on. You will feel and hear everything. And these are... You know, these, this is a typical example of there's a lot of friction left. And, you know, a tip, uh, everybody, anybody taking this off is not going to be so happy. So with us, you're going to get to wear your entire uh, friction on the side. And that's a, that's a serious rust issue. And that happens all day long. A lot of times your noise issues, um, especially with the EVs, are going to be caused by rust and corrosion. That's why you got to go galvanize. Awesome. Well, I think that ties things together really well. We have covered a lot with this conversation today, uh, I, identifying the problem that I really believe a lot of people before listening to this would just not be aware of how potentially dangerous your stock brakes, uh, brake pads specifically could be. We won't say they are, but could be. And then, of course, talking to Blake and getting kind of the extreme aspect of of brake usage and certainly the more of the performance applications um so i want to thank you as i did blake you know for your time to explain this and really talk through something that i think is very valuable consumer advice and information before we end i want to give uh everybody a chance to learn more about nrs brakes and how can they kind of follow along with some of the the progress and innovation that you guys are doing? Uh, you can look at nrsbreaks.com. Um, you can go on there and obviously our Instagram. But I would also recommend you want a full tour of going start to finish of how we make our brake pads. Watch a very popular YouTuber out there, uh, Chris Fix. I think he's like 8 plus million uh, subscribers. And uh, he does a full plant tour uh, right from the beginning. Everything's made right here in Toronto, Canada. You'll see it right from the beginning all the way to the testing uh, at the end of the vehicle. Very cool. Montu, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you.